What's up, Hokie Nation, and welcome into this edition of TSL Today. We record on Friday, May 5th, 2023, from the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center in Blacksburg, Virginia. Got a fun show planned for you today, just like always. Andy Bitter hops on to talk about the Hokies' most recent commitment out of the transfer portal. And then in the second segment, Kyle Marshak will join us to talk both tech baseball and softball. All that and much more coming up on this edition of TSL Today, which starts right now. Welcome you back to this edition of TSL Today. This edition of TSL Today, like always, is sponsored by Triumph NIL. Triumph NIL, recruit, retain, reward. We appreciate Triumph NIL's partnership with TSL and TSL Today. Well, I think some introductions are in order. Across the way is Andy Bitter, our senior staff writer and lead football beat writer. Behind the scenes is Kyle Marshak, today's best podcast producer in the land. And I'm your host, Carter Hill. Well, Andy, before we get underway, thanks for hopping on. First ever TSL Today appearance. So we appreciate you coming in on a Friday afternoon. That's right. It's like a quick shot for the weekend here to get you going. Yes, absolutely. You got the podcast, you got TSL Today. You're fully acclimated into the tech sideline world nowadays. So we appreciate you coming on well it's no secret that the Hokies were looking to you know add a pass rusher out of the transfer portal and they seem to have done that with the addition of Antoine Power Ryland out of Florida yeah a fairly significant addition uh to the class he was a guy that a couple years ago was a top five recruit in the state uh number four in the state I think like number 180 nationally something like that went to Florida Virginia Tech was in on him originally uh did not commit here uh went to Florida Hasn't played a whole lot, but he started to come on a little bit late last season. Uh, I think he had 29 tackles, three sacks, six tackles for loss, something like that. All that came really late in the season uh, when he got into the starting lineup last five games of the year. Uh, They had him playing in this 3-3-5, so he's sort of an outside linebacker. In this de- in that defense, and I think he wanted to be more of a more of a traditional four three end. So coming here to Virginia Tech, he'll get that opportunity. That was a, a great position of need for them to find another edge rusher in this uh, defense they got. Well, you mentioned it, a six foot three, two hundred and thirty three pound edge rusher, originally out of Portsmouth in the seven five seven. Redshirted back in twenty twenty, was a reserve in twenty twenty one, and you mentioned it started the final five games last season with the Gators, finishing with twenty nine tackles, six tackles for loss, and three sacks as well. How much of a priority was he in terms of adding for Virginia Tech? It was a big priority. I mean, you look at the. Uh, returning production they have at defensive end, and I think that's the position that had the biggest question marks on the entire roster. Uh, you know, Cole Nelson, C.J. McRae, probably the first team guys right now. Neither of them had more than two sacks last year. Nobody, no returning end on the roster, a defensive lineman had more than two sacks last year. It's just they had not gotten after the quarterback very well. Especially you lose Taiwan Garbutt, and he had six and a half sacks last season, uh, their most productive pass rusher. So it's just not a position where they had a lot of guys that got after the quarterback. It looks like Powell Ryland can be that type of guy. He showed a little bit of that late last year. I mentioned those five games he started. I think he had 10 quarterback pressures, nine or 10 quarterback pressures in those games so really was showing some production it'll be interesting to see him come in here uh probably needs to get a little bit bigger to play more of a traditional 4-3 spot but it would not surprise me to see him jump into the starting lineup well how much does this change the Hokies outlook up front with his addition it helps I mean that they needed somebody that can get after the quarterback and who knows I mean maybe Cole Nelson uh, maybe Jaden Jordan McDonald. I forget which yeah. one of the McDonald brothers <laughs> is one on the, the defensive two. line. I always mix those two up. Uh, CJ McCray, some younger guys, Keyshawn Burgos uh, there as well. Uh, you know, just not a lot of proven production though. So I'm not saying those guys can't do it, but to add somebody like uh, Powell Ryland into the mix, I, I think that's important because you can never have enough guys to get after the quarterback. Well, I want to go back a little bit. We mentioned it. He's from Portsmouth, an Indian River High School kid, I believe. Is that where Devin Hunter went to high school? Out there? I believe so. I think Indian the River. High okay, school, yes. there you go. How much were the Hokies involved in his initial recruitment out of high school, and what did that kind of look like before he went to Florida? I remember the name. I don't really recall the recruitment uh, too much. I know he was. I think Virginia Tech was among the finalists, but you know, at that point, when an SEC school comes calling and won the caliber of Florida. Uh, at that time, it's not too surprising that he went that route. That's how a lot of the top five guys in the state have gone uh, over the last decade, really. 
uh, in recruiting. So I, I can't remember the specifics of how close, but they were in the mix, and, and, and I don't know how seriously in the, at the very end, though. Well, you mentioned it a little bit, but where do you see him sliding in for Tech? You know, he can compete with a couple guys, but probably safe to say he played a little bit of outside linebacker at Florida, but probably going to play at the end position here, and how do you see him kind of sliding in? Yeah, I, I think of the linemen that Cole Nelson was probably the most established of the mm-hmm. starters there. And I'm afraid, uh, you know, he had a sack in the spring game. I think they needed to see a little bit more out of him just in terms of all around play as a player on the defensive line. He, he was the guy that transitioned from linebacker as well. So he wasn't as used to playing with his hand on the ground like that. Uh, I, I think it could be between McCray and Powell Ryland for that other starting spot. I'd probably give the, the edge to Powell Ryland just based on his history of production, even though it's pretty limited yes. in itself. But I mean, that that's a spot they're going to rotate guys in and out. And, you know, they like to, you know, it seems like defensive line rotations are almost like NASCAR. Like you come in, you get four new tires and they yes. put four new guys out there. They rotate the whole thing or like hockey shifts where a whole new line comes in. Uh, at the same time. So I, I would imagine they would all play quite a bit, but this is just another guy to add to that rotation that, that seems to be fairly productive. Nice experience factor to add as well, it appears like. Yeah, I mean, it, he doesn't have this wealth of experience. Right. I mean, he's played two years and in, in five starts, but you look at the team, and I think uh, Cole Nelson and, and C.J. McRae have combined for three c- career starts between yeah. them. And they're the most experienced defensive ends on the roster. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're talking about a very inexperienced group and and somebody coming in that's not that experienced, but more experienced than what they have. Well, and I think, too, I don't have it in front of me, but Taiwan Garbett, I believe, led the team in sacks last year with six and a half, I want to say. Six and a half. And, he, and so, he got there at the last game of the season. I think yes. he had uh, one and a half or two in that Liberty game, including the one that, that caused the fumble there at the end. Uh, but he was somebody who was fighting a, a foot injury all year, might have had better stats than what he had uh, if he wasn't battling with that. But, I mean, it's been a while since they've had an impact pass rusher here, yeah. somebody that you just fear off the edge. I mean, you really go back to to Daddy Nicholas, Kenna Canem in mm-hmm. that season. Yep. I think they had nine and a half and, and nine sacks. The last guy to have double-digit sacks was Daryl Tapp. Oh, my gosh. And you're going back to like 2000, 2005, 2006. I forget the exact year on that. And There's some controversy about whether Kenny Canem got to 10. I think if VT officially lists him with nine and a half. But, uh, you know, thinking back, I mean, Tap is really the last one uh, defensive end to get drafted and stay yeah. at defensive end in the NFL. Jason Worlds was sort of an outside linebacker type. Daddy Nicholas turned into an outside linebacker type. They just don't have... Uh, you know, for a school that produced Bruce Smith and, and Corey Moore and Daryl Tapp and all these guys, they don't have much of a recent history of defensive ends getting drafted. So, you know, we'll see what Power Island becomes. I don't want to put too much pressure on him before he gets here or anything like that, but uh, he is an intriguing talent to add to this roster. Daryl Tapp was mid-2000s. Kenneth Canem and Daddy Nicholas was the latter half of the Frank Beamer era for a Canem standpoint. I think he was first year or two of the Justin Fuente era as well. So it's been six, seven years since we've really seen that here in Blacksburg. But what's next for Brent Pride? Do you go the Demetrius Hill now? Demetrius Hill route, I should say, from FIU, or do you go the offensive lineman from App State? What What's next for the Hokies coming well, up? Well, I think they're working on both. Uh, it sounds like a decision might be coming soon with Troy Everett, uh, mm-hmm. possibly this weekend. Uh, when you're talking about going up against Oklahoma, that is a tough team to beat. Uh, when you're recruiting against them. I mean, that's one of the blue bloods of college football. And I would imagine there's a lot of NIL money behind that whole thing. So it'd be interesting to see which direction he leans. If the the hometown angle can win out and the immediate playing time angle can win out at Virginia tech, or, you know, if the draw of of Oklahoma and the type of lineman they've produced over the years uh, can be something that that's more enticing for him. But I, I think that would be a big addition for this offensive line just to have a, a fifth guy probably to round out that starting five. And uh, then you look at Demetrius Hill, they, they've been looking for another defensive back, sort of bridge that gap between the, the five experienced guys that they have. And then this younger wave of, of cornerbacks and safeties coming up the, uh, the shoot there. So, uh, you know, both would be priorities. I think probably Everett on the offensive line is a bigger need because mm-hmm. you're looking for a starter in that situation. But, uh, you know, they're, they're still going to be very active in the transfer portal. Well, Andy, as always, thanks for hopping on. Thanks for having me. All right, that'll do it for the first segment of TSL today. Don't go anywhere, though. In the second segment, Kyle Marshak will hop on and we'll do some trivia surrounding both tech baseball and softball. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. 